Hi and welcome to Fail Lab Lectures. In this lecture we will be discussing about Newtonian physics or classical mechanics. The reason why it is called as classical mechanics is because it is classical. It was given by Isaac Newton in uh, 1600, 1642 where he, wherein he was born and by the end of uh, you know um, almost by the end of the 16th century uh, he came up with beautiful laws called the laws of motion the universal law of gravity which is even today uh, you know, one of the best understanding, the best description of one of the basic forces of nature during that time that hence it's called as the greatest generalization of all time by uh, the human beings so Newton was was an incredible genius and for us, you know, people who who uh, consider Einstein to be uh, our role models, Einstein had Newton as his role model. Well, well, let's let's see what Newton has for us to study, and um, and I also like to tell you a few pretty facts in one sense uh, before we start off with Newtonian physics. Alright, so the, the first fact is that uh, people knew, let's say this is a block, in order to move this block people knew that one had to apply some kind of force well, it's all around you, even in terms of Galileo, even in terms of uh, in, in, in period uh, where um, Archimedes was alive or even when Galileo was alive, everybody knows um, you, you have to, um, I mean if you want to drink water, what you need to do is you, you take a container and you fill it up with water and then you drink. So while you fill it up, you, you use some kind of a force, you use your energy and people knew this. And, but very few people uh, gave a thought about all these uh, things that took place in nature. And Galileo was one of them and they knew that in order for this block or anything to move, you need to apply some force and when you apply a force, the velocity of the body changes. So we knew by even before Newton gave up, gave his theory, uh, or sorry, not his uh, laws of motion uh, that explain the relationship between uh, the force and the acceleration very well. So that's what Newton did. But we knew the basics even before Newton. But not taking away any credit from Newton because it's an incredible, incredible discovery that he made. Uh, it's not a discovery yet. Again, as I said. It's already there in the nature. That's what we physicists do. We observe the nature and we come up with beautiful uh, ways in which she works. And um, it is she's so elegant and the laws are so beautiful that we can discover it and we can relive nature. And that is what when you relive, it's called as experiment. And um, well, this is what happens if you come up with the with the right description of how the nature works and that's called, that makes it law. So here is uh, some some points that I'd like to tell about uh, Newton before we start off with the, the force and uh, and and uh, the relationship between the forces and how to calculate the forces and stuff. Newton was born in uh, 1647 I believe and uh, as soon as he was born uh, I don't know for what reason, but um, his father died, um, and uh, his mother married someone else, and uh, uh, she went off. And uh, Newton grew up with uh, her grand, uh, sorry, his grandmother's aunt. Uh, he grew up with his grandmother, and uh, of course he had an estate in in UK, and um, often, very often, he used to go there. And uh, he had Galileo Galilei as his role model in one sense because he knew everything about Galileo Galilei. He was very much interested about about uh, about, the, about physics. I'm sorry about that. Um, so 
Newton was a great genius, you know, in one sense. Uh, when there was plague all around Europe, he was sitting in um, in his uh, estate and then an apple falls on him and he questions why it has to fall, why things have to fall towards the ground. And then began, as I said, the greatest generalization of all time, the, the law of gravity. Uh, and and then uh, he went to Cambridge where he spent at least 13 hours a day studying physics and, uh, by locking himself in a room, literally. Um, so unless and until someone does this much of hard work, you cannot come up with a beautiful law or a theory as such as uh, Newton's. Newton, to be honest, there, there can be no one better than Newton. Not even Einstein, because Newton's contribution to the field of physics is immense. Newton's theory explains every single thing, right from the motion to the motion in the fluids, fluid mechanics. He also gave a, a, a corpuscular theory of light, the particle nature of light. He has opened every door, he has knocked every door in the field of physics. Of course, he was not able to knock, um, you know, um, the electricity door, of course, but uh, he has knocked every single door, almost 80% of physics um, is growing, is being uh, you know, modernized today, but of course, uh, to the person who began every other law, every other, almost 80% of the topics that we study is Newton. So hence, it's a, it's a great pleasure to uh, even talk about Sir Isaac Newton um, and his contributions is immense. Newton's contribution, uh, I, you know, which is correct, is is what we see around us, okay? But as with the decrease of distance or with the increase of huge distances and huge speeds, Newton laws does fail. But we'll discuss about that later. But for now. Uh, what is force? That's a very important thing to define. Well, in the beginning, Newton thought force is just push. Well, of course, it's just push. It's not pull. However, still we are still in classical mechanics. So, you've got to define force like a first grade student and say force is push or pull. Okay? So, force is push or pull and now we shall study more about force. So again, like the diagram that I did before, you know, there is a block of mass m. So in order for something to move, you need to apply uh, apply force. So when you apply force, uh, so if they, even this, you know, here, if you keep this, in, if I just apply force, this thing starts to move in the direction of the black force. That's very important, and. Uh, and this is first understood. The relationship between the force and acceleration was understood first time by Sir Isaac Newton. So force subjects the object to change in its velocity. The change in its velocity is nothing but acceleration. All right. I think you remember change in velocity is nothing but acceleration from the previous lecture. All right. So. Um, then we, we also proved it mathematically, if you remember, by using differentiation and calculus as a as whole. Uh, so Newtonian physics is apply, can be applied to a molecule, the motion of a molecule. Well, you get correct answers. You get correct answers. Newton was lost, the force, you get correct answers. But at, as soon as you go to atomic levels, the Newton's laws fail, well, badly. So, um, this is why the reason that we invented quantum physics. Now, to go to the moon we used Newtonian physics. Well, of course it was perfect because NASA was able to put a man on the moon and it has been my inspiration to take up science in one way um, and the speech of President Kennedy when he said, you know, we chose to go to the moon not because it was not because it was easy, because it was hard, and, and that very good speech that he made in Houston. So, so going to the moon, we used um, this 
same old Newton, Newton laws, Newton's law of gravity, and of course it's perfect even today. But if I'm talking about intergalactic distances, Newton's laws fail. And when I tell you the gravity, uh, gravitational force that we'll do in the coming lectures, in the next or the second lecture from now, which will include gravitational force, I'll tell you what's wrong with the gravitational force. He was not able to define gravitational force. He had to make an, make an assumption about gravitational force. So, Newton's laws are not applicable when it comes to big, big distances, like intergalactic distances. So it fails again. Hence you need relativity. Thanks to Albert Einstein, we already have one. We have an, uh, a, 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 you know, we get an approximate idea about how space and time is and why gravity is an attractive force rather than someone being pulling something. So that's very bad. But of course, it's part of history. And as I said, if not working Newton, we wouldn't have uh, had so much of um, luxury or, or uh, we enjoy so much of technology that today people forget to use their brains while adding two and three is equal to five. They just forget. They use calculator. But not all people, however, many people do that. So, but in one way, yes, it is good, but in other way, it is not good. Uh, however, not talking about technology, we just straight away jump into uh, Newton's first law. As I said, Newton's first law holds good everywhere on this planet Earth. And let me remind you, if I uh, any uh, assumption that I make, any instant that I take, uh, Earth is being regarded as an inertial frame of reference. Inertial frame of reference or a frame of reference is a, is a it's just a, like a reference. As I said before in the previous lecture, it's a reference in which some laws are applicable. Inertial frame of reference is a is a frame of reference in which Newton's laws are applicable. All right, and Earth should not be considered as an inertial reference frame, but of course we're considering it as an inertial reference frame uh, for our uh, understanding purposes. So, uh, so this uh, inertial, non-inertial frame of references, uh, non-inertial frame of references is uh, again a frame of reference which in which Newton's laws doesn't hold good. All right. So, so for example, if you're going uh, to a black hole, you know, you're just going into the black hole, and you're already in the black hole, and we know that Newton's laws doesn't work <laughs> in the black hole, and we don't know what laws works inside the black hole even today. So, I mean, unless you you studied Hawking's, you know, radiation and stuff, we know the radiation, some of the radiation escapes are and stuff, but we don't know what are the laws. If you are I mean, living in the black hole, you don't know what loss to expect. I mean, you don't know what to write, you know? F is equal to MA, does it hold good? Well, we don't know. So, again, so we're going to discuss about what things that works around us, and uh, it is in perfect sense to, to first study what's around us and then go for something beyond our realm of imagination, I mean, understanding. That means the imagination comes in, not the philosophy, of course. So the Newton's first law is what we'll study now. So Newton's first law says, if there is no opposition to the motion of the body, the body continues to accelerate. So if there is no opposition, in the sense that there is, the body is at rest, before Galileo, I mean, like before Newton, Galileo's, uh, you know, the theories in the book said that the body which is at rest is the basic nature of a body. It is to remain at rest. So if the body is at rest, it's, it's nature. Nature, the body in nature is to remain, tendency to remain at rest in its nature. But however, when Newton said, if there is no force acting on a body, the body tends to remain at rest rest or in motion and hence uh, it's called as inertia. The principle of inertia states that the body tends to remain in state of rest or in its state of motion unless and until a force is compared against it so to opposite, uh, you know, the opposition is provided uh, in order to change the state of the body. 
So it is the first law of motion as well as uh, the law of inertia. So the first law of motion, Newtonian mechanics, the first law of Newtonian mechanics is either called as the law of inertia or as the first law of motion. Both are almost same. So, um, next we study something about force before we go into the second law. So what is force? As I said, push or pull. So what if I say, whenever you write a force, say F, you always indicate the direction. That means force is a vector. It, it, it is applicable. I mean, vectors laws, vector laws that we discussed in the previous lectures are applicable to force. Uh, so hence, you can add them vectorially, you can multiply them, you can do whatever you want. Any vector operation is is applicable to force. And hence, it's a vector. It has both direction as well as magnitude. So this is by the force, for sure, pull as it is defined as of now. Uh, and then comes mass. Well, this is something that we don't understand even today properly. So mass is something that comes with the existence of the particle itself. For example, if I take, uh, you know, you, everybody knows Newton's laws, F is equal to ma, right? Where F and a, acceleration in the previous lectures have told you that it is a vector, so F is equal to ma. So the product of a scalar, mass is scalar, and acceleration vector gives you a vector. So if you might, the product of a vector and a vector is a scalar. I've told you this. So here, F is a vector in one sense because we are multiplying a vector and a scalar. So you get a vector. So don't worry, okay? You don't have to give uh, more explanation if you cannot remember that I said that force. Uh, you know, uh, the vector's laws are applicable to the force. So the vector addition is applicable to force vector. Subtraction is applicable to the force. And uh, multiplication is also applicable to force. So anyway, so here a physical MA. So let me stay, take a standard uh, mass M0 as 1 kilograms, 1 kg. So F is equal to 1 into acceleration. So F in this equation, in this equation, changes with a. So that means the magnitude of f is equal to magnitude of a. So if I apply a force of two two newton, uh, how newton? What is newton in one sense? So here, again, let's discuss about the um, about the units in which the force is, um, you know, expressed in. So for m, it is m mass. Here, if you remember from the first lecture measurements, we are using the dimensional analysis here. So for m, it is capital M. For acceleration, it is L t minus 2. It is, yes, L t minus 2. L t minus 2 because it is acceleration formula is velocity by time. Velocity is L t minus 1. Again, divided by time is L t minus 2. And again, write it. You can write it in this way: m l t minus two. That means it's kg meter per second squared. So kg meter per second squared as a whole is called as Newton. Capital N on the honor of Sir Isaac Newton. We uh, express it in terms of newtons, or you can also represent, uh, you know express it in terms of kg meter per second square. Generally what we do when we are trying to convert uh, these SI units to CGS or, or, or any other systems which is as I said a waste of time uh, you generally use this otherwise mutants is what uh, we express uh, you know uh, mutants loss uh, I'm sorry force in uh, in mutant. So force is expressed in terms of mutant and uh, and in this here again, let's come back to the problem that we're talking about. So M is standard. M is equal to one kilogram. 
And even if you take just this equation, if you don't put m is equal to 1 kg, f varies proportional to acceleration. So if you if you apply a 4 Newton force, the acceleration also is 4 times the initial acceleration of the body. If you apply 8 Newton of force, the acceleration is also 8 times the initial acceleration of the body, if it had any, okay? So that's the way. Force is directly proportional to the acceleration. So if you remove the acceleration sign, you get the above equation of physical MA. So that's what Mr. Sir James Isaac Newton did. So this explains the second law of Newton, but it doesn't explain mass. So what is mass? So for example, what you can do sitting at home is you take a baseball, you take a, a what? Let me say a ping pong ball. You take a baseball and a ping pong ball and kick both the balls. Which ball will move faster? Anybody's guess the ping pong ball moves faster. It is because the ping pong ball's mass, MP here, is lower compared to that of the baseball. The baseball mass is higher and the ping pong ball mass is lower compared to that of the baseball. So we are talking about the relative masses here. So, so the ping pong ball is expected to go faster. That means that the force has I mean the mass has certain impact on the way the body is accelerated. Isn't it? So this is uh, one of the definitions of mass if we can define it but however I have more simpler definition for you uh, which is more standardized. We don't have a perfect definition for mass. We don't have a perfect definition for charge. And that's the reason why we are, we are hunting for a particle called as the goddamn particle or people call it as a god particle, uh, the Higgs boson. So we are hunting for that particle uh, to find that particle so that we can define why mass exists in this world. We don't know why it exists. But however we know that the mass exists with the very own existence of the particle itself or I exist hence I have mass. If there is a particle called as an electron it exists but you shall not compare. Of course I, I have to tell this. I am temp too tempted to say this. Uh, there are particles that does not have mass. The rest mass of photon is zero. It is because, according to relativity, those particles, uh, photons, shall not stop. The photons always keep traveling at the speed of light. And hence, the rest mass of photon is zero only because it should not come to rest. So the photon never comes to rest and hence its mass is never zero. So it does have some mass, but we don't know how much at this point of time. So, so the mass plays a vital role in terms of uh, force and the acceleration of the body. So mass is an intrinsic property that comes with the very own existence of the particle or a body itself. So everything or anything that exists or matter as a whole, you know, has a property called as mass. So the mass is an intrinsic, it comes within the existence of the body, with the existence of the body. So that's that's what mass is. So one more principle that is very, very important for one to understand here. When when you write F is equal to M A, of course everyone writes the vectors F and M F and A are vectors. M is a scalar but one shall not forget that this force that we are writing on the left hand side is a is a sum of all the forces. So say for example here there is a principle called as the superposition of forces. So let let me take a rigid body here. It's a rigid body. Okay. So there are numerous forces acting on this body F1, F2, F3 and uh, F4 and F5 sorry F5 uh, F5 is acting again all the forces are to be F4 and F5 so all the these forces are acting on the rigid body so what do you do then? The force when you put in 
this equation f is equal to ma, this is f net. It is the vector sum of all the forces. So that is what you are putting actually. You are not taking one force. Since it is a rigid body, you cannot take an individual force. You will have to take all the forces and the sum of the vector sum of all the forces because uh, a force is vector you have the vector sum of all forces or you know one more f5 as well so f1 plus f2 plus f3 plus f4 plus f5 is equal to f net so what you do then is you replace it i'm going to draw an equivalent diagram here i'm so sorry if i cannot get the same shape again so you represent it with a single force, say F net. Here, F net is a single force, one single force that has the same effect of all these five forces acting on the same body. So, F net is also a single force acting on the same body, but it has the effect of all these five forces. And this principle is called as the superposition of forces. Out of common sense, you may just think that what if uh, this F net force produces more than the effect produced by the sum of all these five forces? Well, it doesn't happen. Nature doesn't work that way. Okay? So the nature always follows this superposition of forces. While you solve problems, it's very, very important that when you uh, substitute the value for F or while solving the equation, that you write uh, the sum of all these forces by considering this important. Uh, uh, it, you know, uh, important definition, you know, the superposition of force, an important principle that one ha one has to follow. Not just with with Newton's laws. Even when until we finish classical mechanics, superposition of forces plays a very important role. Okay, so superposition of forces is defined as as an individual force. It's that individual force that produces the same effect as the sum of all individual forces acting on the same body. So, that's very important for you uh, when, coming, when, when you solve the problems. So now that we finished one of the principles, now we can go directly into the physical MA. So this is the Newton's second law. Newton's second law states that the net forces acting on a body produces acceleration and the relationship between the net forces acting on the body and the acceleration is given by a formula F equals the product of mass of the body and the acceleration it produces. So this is F is equal to MA. Alright? So the next thing that we, I mean you can do also you know put the values for M and A and you can find out uh, the force, uh, you know, that I don't know, it's already been done in the high school or something that I'm not going to do now. Okay? Uh, it's quite simple if you know the multiplication you can do and I believe everyone knows it. Uh, so I'm uh, just going to skip uh, to the another principle that, I, that I'm uh, you know, eager to tell and share about. The next principle is, again, three dimensions. The reference frames. This is the Z, and this is the X, and this is the Y, again. Okay. So there is a body here, and I will represent it with a big dot here, a big body, say P, and uh, it is traveling in, in three dimensions. So it is very important for you to say that the force in this direction is FX, it's accelerating, actually, or not. It's accelerating in this direction, in the x direction. As well, since it's moving, so it's accel uh, in three dimensions, you need to consider the forces in all three dimensions. Okay? So the body is moving in, uh, I mean, the acceleration is indicated towards my right. So the body is accelerating that way. So, so what next? So when you calculate fx force in the x direction we get m a x f y is equal to m a y it's all the basics of vector I'm not going to explain it how I got it again I think you understand it it's quite simple 
So the component of accelerations in each direction that has been taken here, again the component of force in each uh, axis according to the each direction in one sense, again taken here. So Fx, Fy and Fz are not all the same. Fy and Fz in this case is zero because the acceleration in, in those two directions are zero. So the acceleration in X is independent of the acceleration in Y and acceleration is y in y is independent of the other two axes. So at any given point of time, acceleration in a particular direction is independent of the acceleration in the other two directions. Hence, when you apply this to the acceleration, you might, all, you might as well apply that to the forces as well because the force is directly proportional to the acceleration. The relation itself will suggest that the force in a direction is independent of the force in the other two directions. So the acceleration in this case uh, is independent of the other two directions. So it's an important and a vital result again just like the superposition of forces, the principle of the superposition of forces, one has to remember these when solving problems because now we will be discussing how you, how you solve problems and why you have to take so much of care. Well, welcome to problem solving by using Newton's laws. So the first thing you do is you draw a free body diagram. So what is a free body diagram? Well, I forgot to mention that when you take forces, when you consider forces, it always has to be an external force. That means the force acting on the body. So if you if you are trying to calculate the force on me, when like you are applying Newton's laws on me, what you have to apply or if you have to take into consideration is that the forces that are acting on me, I may be do you know applying force on uh, say this pen, but it's none of your business. <laughs> Just joking. You shall not consider the force that the body is applying. So it's the force that I am applying or the body applies is called as an internal force and the body, the forces that are applied on the body is called as an external force. So the external forces are to be considered while you solve using Newton's laws. The first thing, the free body diagram, even if the body you are considering is a bus, you always, uh, you know, represent the bus with the point, okay, point, and I know you can, I hope you can see the point here, point P, I will draw it bigger, but you have to, while solving Newton's laws, you will have to uh, show or represent it with a smaller dot, a point mass object, so it's a point that you, sh you show, so I, I'm applying Newton's laws to myself here, remember, so it's me, I'll just take out P and I'll write Sanjay, alright? So let's calculate uh, or apply Newton's laws on my body at this point of time, okay? This is Sanjay. See, I'm this, I'm 6 feet long and I weigh about 60 kilograms but still I'm representing with, with a point mass, okay? So what are the forces acting on my body? One is that the earth is pulling me. <laughs> earth is pulling me. Of course, it's not true, but, uh, but according to Newton's laws, yes it is. So, mg is the force with which it is pulling me. So, my weight is is what is because of the earth's pulling. We'll discuss about the weight later. For now, this is the way you need to do. And the normal force. Again, normal force we'll, we'll discuss later. Since there is no sideward acceleration. I'm not going in this direction or in this direction. Right now I'm standing still. So N is equal to mg is the equation that you get. And if you solve this, the normal force is what this is called. The reason why I, I'm not sinking into the earth because of the earth's gravitational force is because of the presence of normal force. I'll explain in detail when we come to the, when we come to the type of forces later on. But however, while solving the problem, it is very, very important to know 
what are the external forces acting on a body. So on my body, oh, there are only two external forces that are acting. The first external force is the gravitational force due to the earth and the second force is the normal force that is opposing the gravitational force uh, that is being applied on my body by the floor that I stand in. Okay? The floor actually applies the nat normal force. It is called as normal force because it is perpendicular to the whichever place you stand, the perpendicular to that place, to the ground is what is the normal force and the gravitational force is directly towards the center of the earth and everybody knows that. I hope. So the second thing is you got to consider something called a system. So the second most important thing that you need to consider, I'm just going to rub it or make it short so that I can write all the important points that you have. One has to consider why, uh, you know, uh, consider, you know, when solving problems. So this is me again, Sanjay. And the force is acting on me is the weight of my body and uh, the normal force. As I said, N is equal to W. We'll, we'll discuss about both the forces later on. Okay, here. The second po uh, point that we need to consider is system. My body is a rigid body. If I make change to my, you know, if it is linked, my body, every part of my body is linked to the main part of my body. Hence, I'm rigid in one sense, solid. I'm a solid. So all solids are rigid. So, in that case, even if, if somebody is as awkward as a human being, you know, with all the arms ready to fly away in all different directions, you can consider it as a system. Okay? So rigid bodies, fine. Consider it as a system. But now, if there are four or five human beings alone, okay, and they are not linked, interlinked, then you cannot consider all as a system. Then you will have to be particular, choosy about whom you want to select. So here, let me take blocks instead of human beings. I cannot draw human beings. So here, one, two, three blocks are there. They are not linked. It is on the ground, actually, you can see. And there are forces from it, you know, the weight and the normal forces and so on. For the s same for all, since it's not accelerating in uh, either uh, plus x direction or minus x direction. So uh, there is nothing else for me to indicate. So there is no force acting on the body other than the two forces that have been indicated. So here, these three cannot be taken as a system. You will have to choose one. You cannot apply, you know, Newton's laws, you cannot collectively apply Newton's laws on all these three bodies at the same time. See, I apply Newton's laws in particular to every single body, right? You cannot, you, you cannot add the weight of these three, 1, 2, 3, M1, W1, W2, W3, and you, can, you cannot solve Newton's laws. It would be very foolish to do. So the thing is, you have to be very particular while choosing the system that you want to choose. So the Newton laws are to be applied particularly to certain bodies and those certain bodies uh, are, you know, you have to define it as, uh, you know, that you are measuring the forces uh, on that particular body and hence it's called as a system, okay? So, um, again, the forces, that when you consider, if I, by any sort, you know, connect these three uh, um, blocks with a, say, rod, then I can consider the entire three blocks as a system. Then what I do is I, again, apply the principle of superposition of forces and then I solve. Okay? That will be easy. But if not, if you define a system as one block, you have to take one block and you cannot, uh, you know, consider the forces applied by the other block on this force nor the force is applied by this block on the other f on the block. So it is vital for one to do these two steps. But of course we will discuss about, uh, about how to solve these problems later in the next series of lectures. Hopefully I will be able to do that uh, after completing the relativity that I am planning to.
So next we go to the types of forces. So what are the types of forces? Well, as I said before, gravity is one, not the gravitational force that exists between the two bodies. It's a basic force. I'm not going to I'm not talking about that, however. I'm talking about, I'm still on earth, I'm not in this space, okay? Don't worry. So the second thing is the normal force. Third is the frictional. And um, fourth being the tension. Of course, I can talk about the spring and all, but we'll discuss about that in the later, upcoming, upcoming lectures. So for now, first, gravity. Yes, weight. My weight, as I said before, 60 kilograms, approximately. Everybody is on this earth, standing in this way, because of the earth's gravitational pull on every single thing towards the center of the earth. And it's called as a gravitational force. And because of gravity, my weight, as I said, W, is 60 kilograms. So if I apply Newton's laws to that, F is equal to mg is what I get because the gravitational force, I mean the acceleration here is the acceleration due to gravity and the force is also towards the ground. So you, of course here F and G both are negative. Acceleration due to gravity is acting downwards hence negative. The force is also acting downwards hence negative. Both cancel out and it becomes a positive uh, equation here. So if you can get my point, so let me just uh, derive it in one sense. So we all know that F equals MA. Um, so F again, you take minus M into minus G because it's the acceleration due to gravity, right? That uh, the Earth is pulling me towards the Earth, hence my acceleration due to gravity is also directed towards the Earth, that is downwards hence minus g and the force takes the direction of the acceleration hence minus f is equal to m minus g because the force is also acting downwards it's not acting upwards if it was acting upwards i would be flying in space and, uh, and we, if that had to happen we would not require big big rockets to send men or you know uh, well, in sometimes satellites or sometimes space jump in this space. <laughs> and so, uh, F minus F is equal to MG again. Uh, the two minus signs cancel out, then you get F is equal to MG. So, the force here that we are calculating is nothing but weight. Okay, it's called as weight. So, that is W is equal to MG. So, if my weight is 60 kilograms, M into, I think, G as 10 meter per second squared, like always do. So, 6 kilograms is my mass. See? 6 kilograms is my mass. It's quite simple, you yeah? So, this is all about the gravity and what it, how your weight is uh, in, relate, in relation to that of gravity. But, of course, when, I, when we talk about gravitational force, we'll talk much in detail about about these things and what happens uh, and uh, um, in detail uh, when we get to the Newton's law of gravity. Of course, not in this lecture. This is all I have for gravity. Normal force, again as I said, when I stand on, go on the floor or on any patch of earth, there is a deformation that takes place. So if, say there is a ball rolling on a plane, then the, the w there is weight for the ball uh, since it has mass. So what exactly happens is wherever it rolls, there is a, a bit of deformation that, that takes place here. And I'm doing all sort of these highlighting here. This, this deformation takes place. So the weight is pulling, pushing it down, and this deformation actually is opposed by the floor and hence 
because of this opposition, what you get is a force that is perpendicular to that of the that of the surface and is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the other weight and hence it is called as a normal force. It is perpendicular to the surface. Normal force always acts perpendicular to the surface and this weight it always acts in the opposite direction but in equal magnitude to that of the weight of the ball. Hence this is the reason why normal force exists. It is because uh, of the resistance opposite. Normal force is nothing but the resistance uh, uh, you know, offered by the surface uh, for this deformation uh, against the deformation caused due to the weight. So normal force is the opposition offered by the surface against the deformation due to the weight. Alright? So now frictional force Frictional force is something that everyone experiences. If there was no frictional force, what would happen is, well, you have your car and you take it out for a drive and if the road was not rough, it would be as if you are sliding on, on the ice, like people slide on the ice. Every day it would have been so, unless your, your tire has these marks that help you increase the friction and uh, you know, the road, the tarmac is also rough surface and it also increase, helps increase the friction. So, what exactly happens for in, when you consider friction? I'll give you an example here. Again, there is a block. I love taking blocks as examples. And uh, I'm applying a force in this direction. Don't. This is a capital F that I'm representing. The force that I'm applying here, this is capital F. Alright? So this is a block that is being it is on a surface. Okay? It is on a surface. And I'm pushing it. So, but the block does not accelerate uh, on in terms of the force that I've applied. So there will be a little bit of resistance because what exactly happens at this interface where the block touches the surface is bonding or linking. There are free electrons present on, on the surface. There are free electrons uh, present in the bottom side of the block that I am taking. So what, they ha what the happens is uh, they form a weak bond, a Van der Waals bond, a Van der Waals force between each the for Van der Waals force of attraction, uh, you know, when you don't know what kind of force is happening, uh, you know, uh, I mean, like the force of attraction in these kind of cases in chemistry, what you always do is you blame it on Van der Waals. So, Van der Waals force of attraction, uh, just kidding. So, Van der Waals force of attraction always occurs uh, between these two. There is the linkage of bonds, the bonds form and they break. And uh, the friction always acts in the opposite direction to that of the force applied. So, a small letter f is the friction. So, the friction occurs or is present in the direction opposite to that of the force you apply. So, friction uh, occurs in the opposite direction. It always occurs along the, the the place at which the contact takes place, it occurs along the con the place of contact, and it occurs in the opposite direction to that to that of the applied force. So, the friction is just the opposition to the motion, just like resistance in a conductor. Resistance is the op opposition offered by the conductor to the con to the flow of electrons through it. So, the same way when you're trying to uh, in, in a bigger macro world, if you are trying to move something, there is always friction and sometimes friction can be helpful, sometimes friction can reduce the efficiency. But we will discuss about this in the next lecture where we will consider friction, drag and momentum. Alright? So for now, uh, that's about the friction. Now, for the tension, consider this pulley here and uh, I'm suspending a block of mass M and uh, generally whenever we take this thread or, or a rope 
we can we again as i said consider it as massless so so there there is the the rope has no mass and the masses are being suspended so the m2 is greater in mass compared to m1 hence is lower and you can it's just common sense so the tension is is present in that of the string or the rope so it upholds it supports uh, you know the mass is tense it's, it's one of those forces that you will solve when it comes to the problems however not right now so these are the introduction uh, to the or the basic knowledge that one has to know when it comes to the Newton laws of course if you are preparing for IIT J or J main or J advanced exams you cannot expect ma more questions from here you will always expect more questions from the electrostatics or electrodynamics uh, section of physics um, unfortunately but you will have four or five questions here um, so Newton's laws is uh, very important uh, also the problem solving in neural laws is also very very important when it comes to the exam point of view but uh, this is these lectures are not for those who are preparing for exams of course it's just for spreading science and uh, of course this is a very high level physics that we are discussing but uh, you know in terms of uh, you, know, you know people in bachelor degrees are being taught about these things uh, but when we solve the problems you will understand how we develop these basic ideas and solve uh, you know, a bit complex problems in, in physics that we are about to encounter. So Newton you know, understood the nature better than anyone else uh, at this point of time and Newton's laws have ruled the world of physics for more than three centuries and uh, uh, everything says about So what happened after 1727 Newton died uh, well, Newton's laws was, a, was the main source of information for everyone around the world. Any contradiction to Newton's laws was completely rejected uh, for many, many years until 1900s that people were able to come out of Newton's uh, mesmerizing phenomenon, uh, you know, where everybody was just thinking that, okay, what, what Sir Isaac Newton has said is the correct and of course light was believed to be corpus uh, you know corpuscles that means the particle nature but however we he did so much of experiment for a person to do so much of contribution to the field of physics as vast as it is is immense that in a small lifetime it's just 80 or 70 years that an average human can stay and in, in on earth you know 75 years is what is as of today is the average life expectancy of a man and um, well to contribute so much to the field of physics is something that's great and um, I take my hats off to uh, Newton but of course as I said my role models are Einstein and Feynman but I would have started off the lectures with uh, Einstein's relativity uh, and quantum electrodynamics of Richard Philip Feynman but the point is if you don't know these kind of if you don't know what's around you wh how will you understand what's beyond the realm of you know understanding so uh, so the things that happens in the corners of the universe is beyond the realm of our understanding but relativity and quantum electrodynamics in one way uh, helps us understand what ha what happens in the bigger world when you apply relativity to it, what happens to the world, you know, within the atom, uh, when you apply quantum electrodynamics? So the mechanics, so thermodynamics, the kinematics, or uh, everything can be applied. Uh, I mean, within for if you are measuring something within the uh, level of atom, within the atomic level is what is called. You can apply for uh, you know quant you can apply quantum electrodynamics to QED. Uh, so it's a new way of electrodynamics, it's a new law of electrodynamics that explains a new set of laws that, uh, that tells you how things work within an atom. But Newton's laws don't and relativity explains how the space is curved around big mass objects like Sun, Earth, 
moon and and relativity also tells you how much of curvature is there you know if as for a bigger star like sun this the curvature is around 0.7 approximately 0.7 arc seconds so it's just a small degree uh, uh, that that it is for a big big star so you can calculate you can apply for the galaxies but you cannot apply the same thing uh, with the Newton's law hence we need relativity hence we need quantum electrodynamics uh, hence we need quantum mechanics as a whole uh, but however these days it's it's a sad thing that people uh, you know just make all these assumptions just to make their theory right it's very important that you see the way the nature works not the way you want your theory to work so Newton made a guess when he was asked why gravity is an attractive force he said force is a pull but to be honest force is not a pull it's just push until Einstein he came up with the relatively he said the space fabric is pushing everything down it's a pull force gravitational force is also a pull it's not a push uh, sorry it's also a push not a pull I'm so sorry so until Einstein relatively we never knew about this and Newton again he made a guess only to I mean his theory is correct I'm not saying it, it's not correct but it has its limitations and uh, well he made an assumption and well it's wrong so that's why I think even today when people make assumptions in the field of quantum uh, quantum mechanics we just don't believe on at first glance unless we have proofs unless we do the experiments again we cannot do experiments that are in the quantum electrodynamics quantum world because uh, even for the quantum electrodynamics we don't know but until now we have not found uh, an exception to the quantum electrodynamics hence it's correct and hence the Nobel prize was given to uh, award it to Richard Feynman um, so until we find exceptions to those theories we don't know whether it is correct or wrong and we never know maybe in the next hundred years or two hundred years somebody may come up and say you don't new I mean sorry the quantum uh, world that we know as of today is completely wrong so it makes I mean but well people scientists few scientists not all few told me that because of this because of the uncertainty that exists with the quantum electrodynamics world it is not necessary for one to study it but I believe that's the beauty of physics you don't know what's in there what's out there so every single day if you without the existence of this uncertainty what would be the life of a man it would be so boring for a physicist to do the same experiment that has already been proved but of course it is very important for one to do the experiments that has already been proved right so um, well the, the, admit, the admission of uncertainty or the ignorance that we can hope for a better tomorrow and the better uh, uh, mankind mankind will be heading in a better direction uh, so because of what we don't know so if we know everything what's what's the fun of life so physics is all about this today a theory may be 100 percent correct and tomorrow somebody may come up with an exception and then instead of uh, well you know basically what you do is you just correct and you go for excellency it's a name for excellency that we have in physics and we are always aiming for excellent results thank you very much for watching